Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode 7 of Movie Dumpster. Today, we are talking about Death Note, directed by Adam Wingard from 2017. I'm Joel Scola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. And I'm Connor McGraw, and yes! <laughs> Welcome to the dumpster. Shall we begin? I am probably more excited than I was when we were talking about Equilibrium. And I like Equilibrium. This, uh, I'm gonna just go out there and say, you have a director who can direct the shit out of, um, a great, uh, sort of 80s horror, uh, nostalgia, okay? Uh, The Guest was great. Um, even the segments from VHS 1 and 2 were fine. With what I know from him, he is now, like, he's two for two. This, and I was not a fan of the new Blair Witch at all really i liked the new blair witch i thought it was fine i didn't like it until the last 20 minutes really yes as far as updating it for the younger people now like with the with the first blair witch when that dropped like it made sense it was like a bunch of film students that have a film camera and they go out and they do this documentary fine for like a thesis or some shit right i think that's why they go out there but the way that they updated it for now i think was great like i love the use of the drone and uh the gopros and stuff like that i thought that was i thought that was pretty smart the way that they put that all together no that's fine i just i'm not like i think uh found footage formula is wearing on me to the point where i'm like i don't like these people they're doing the same things that most people in found footage movies do uh but then it sprung to life when i was like is the forest a fucking time loop and that's kind of what i took out of it and that was what i liked about it but everything else i kind of found just you know very rude teen and i didn't really get into it yeah i'd agree i mean but I, i'm saying like uh, for what it was it was fine yeah it just wasn't for me yeah it's not like an amazing movie by any stretch but it works for what it's trying to do i think in my opinion this movie is for nobody no it's not for anybody <laughs> i don't know who this was made for we're taking a, a japanese drama and we're trying to put like an 80s horror spin on it and it just does not fit together well um this happens a lot every time america wants to take a japanese property and and do something with it, we get this lukewarm, watered-down bullshit. That's because we suck the cultural relevance out of it. They suck the soul right out of all, all the stories. I mean, I mean, look at Godzilla. Like, that's something I, I drew a conclusion to. Like, this is the equivalent of the 98 Godzilla and what they had done to that. Oh, yeah, totally. That's pretty much how I feel about it. And in the same token, like, if Godzilla, if 98 Godzilla was called something else and totally, completely different and separated from Godzilla, I would actually enjoy that movie. But it's not a bad disaster slash monster movie. It's a horrific Godzilla movie. Yeah, it's an awful Godzilla movie. That That's kind of like, you know, putting the uh, cart before the horse here, but that's kind of how I feel with this movie. Like, I don't think it's great by any stretch of the imagination, but the fact that it's Death Note and I'm like a huge fan of the original series like literally like I, it was hard for me to detach an opinion from that because there were so many things that just clashed with the original source material that it's just like what were they thinking like call this something else see and I'm glad I'm glad we have varied uh, relationships with source material because never read the manga never watched the anime Joe you said you've read the manga I've only read the first book that Sean let me borrow so you've grazed the surface and Sean it likes it Sean's read it all and has seen the anime yeah and I have no I have no bias towards the original source material, and I think this movie is a fucking flaming pile of garbage. From what I've read, I really enjoyed it, and I know that I would have liked the rest of it, because I've read about where that story goes and, and how it unfolds. But this is... Yeah, and I mean, like, you know, we're going to get right into it, I think, but I, I, I think one of the biggest problems that this movie faces, even from the get-go, is that you're trying to tw take a 12-volume long manga series, and I want to say over, like, 20 or 50, I, I don't know, two seasons worth of an anime, essentially. And you're trying to cram, like, a large portion of that into an hour and a half long movie. But then also on top of that... You're also changing the plot lines. You're changing the way the characters interact with each other. You're changing the rules of the way that things are supposed to operate. So it's like you're juggling all these balls 
and like they all kind of just fall flat on the ground. This is why I hold I hold steadfast to the philosophy of like everyone's like, oh, when's the Akira movie coming out? Never, because it's unfilmable. Uh, well, it's not unfilmable, but it just won't be done justice. It will not be done justice. This movie, Death Note, is an hour and sixty minutes, and I gotta tell you something. There was a bunch of times where I was checking my fucking watch because it just was dragging ass. It, it was going nowhere. It was just a bunch of nothing. You know what's funny is that it drags ass, but somehow spends no time on anything. Okay. All right. Let's get into right. it. Let's yeah. Let's get let's, let's get this dissection in process because there's a lot to take off from this. So, uh, Light Turner is a young high school student who happens upon uh, the titular death note that falls out of the sky. Let's let's also point out the fact that we don't know any, we don't know this dude's name no. before the no. death note falls out of the sky. We're treated to a Donnie Darko-esque 80s music montage of students being students and it's just like right, of the, right from the get-go you're like this doesn't feel quite right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't feel right at all. He acquires this, this notebook in which he can he finds out that he can write down people's names and kill them remotely as long as he sees their face and knows their name it is godly divine power and that's going to be a problem in this movie <laughs> because the weight of this power is completely dismissed so like connor had said we open on this montage that's indicative of it, it's it's an 80s teen horror movie sort of feeling all i could think of was the uh head over heels sequence from donnie darko the tear the the long slow-mo uh tears for fear shot yeah and i'm torn because i'm like this works but not for this fucking source material. This is so far off base from what uh, you needed for this. I don't like this movie at all, but it's upsetting to me because there's a lot of things that I could like about it if it were something else. So we open up on this slow-mo uh, montage, semi-introducing us uh, visually to the uh, a couple main characters, which includes a cheerleader who smokes cigarettes in front of everybody on school grounds. I don't understand that entirely. <laughs> How the fuck she gets away with that? But hey, whatever. Hey, it's Seattle. Fuck it. It's the 90s. So light. We, we see him exchanging uh, homework for, like, fucking drugs, and he's chilling on a bench, and he's he's like, yeah, man, I got that calculus. need that shit. So I was like, oh, fuck, man. Yeah, here, take this 20. And he's selling fucking calculus homework like nobody's business, which, you know, ain't a bad gig. It also, actually, it's like, oh, our lead character is smart. And then you forget he's smart by the end of the film. <laughs> because who could fucking give a shit because he's an asshole? <laughs> yeah, and it's, I feel like they purposely did that to just, like, you know, just be like, oh, look, he's smart. Get it? And then it's like like you just kind of said like they don't really ever follow up with it like towards the end of the movie i think they kind of do but like the whole like middle chunk it's just like this guy's acting like a moron no he's a blithering idiot for most of this movie <laughs> they're trying to set it up so that like he is kind of a a force to be reckoned with with l you know what i mean yeah, yeah. but it just it just fucking fails badly so he's sitting on a bench and this fucking book falls out of the sky just like oh here's the book here you go Here's the death note. We're given no context, no introduction to anyone's names, no idea what their personality types are, nothing. There's no, like, there's, they don't let anything boil. Bam. Book. Just like, huh, there's a book. Huh, I'm gonna pick it up. Huh, death note. Okay. Yeah, and he's just like, oh, this book fell from the sky. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Fuck it. Whatever. Uh, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember him, like, going into an alternate dimension and acquiring this book. No. That's not how that like works? That. No, it's just, uh, this, it's actually similar to what happens in the movie. The, the, the difference is he's, like, in class, and they make a point about how he's so smart that he's, like, just bored out of his mind. And then he just sees it laying on the lawn, like, it would have already have fallen. It wasn't, like, right next to him when it happens, like, in this film. It's, like, he sees it from a window, and then he goes out on his lunch break and is, like, oh, what is this? And he picks it up. So, that, see, that makes it seem like it's more of a mutual choice between like because i guess like the book and ryuk have their own motivations it's like the book is kind of sentient um it kind of makes it seem like you know they were meant to find each other rather than this thing this plot device literally fell into your hands yeah well it, it's definitely an extension of ryuk he's definitely way more benevolent in comparison I mean, I, I don't mind that so much because of the way that they play the character up. I mean, I don't like things about that per se, if that makes any sense, though. But I don't mind it in that scenario. So Light finds a d Light, by the way. An American boy named Light. I don't fucking think so. Sorry. <laughs> 
and they changed his fucking name. His name is Light Yagami in, in the Japanese version, and his name's Light Turner in this one. I, it's it's the most half-assed attempt to take an anime name and turn it into a regular Just name. change his fucking name. I, I don't know. Like, you'll never meet a person named Bulma, and I sure as shit will never meet a person named Bulma Turner. Just change it. His name's, now his name's Jake Turner, okay? There you go. You know you know what was worse, though, was his, was his fucking father's name. His, his fucking James Turner, and the original he was like Sochiro. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's like a super Japanese name. Like, you're, it's not going to fly in the, in this context, but it's like, at least it didn't really even try. Or, 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 you just cast an Asian family and call it a day. No, because we, we're, we're still suffering the trope where we're casting white dudes as Asian people. Jesus Christ, didn't John Wayne play Genghis Khan at one point? He did. Yeah, he sure did. So that's what we're dealing with in this movie, and that's another big problem with me. So anyway, we we are introduced to these these two bullies, and this kid is a piece of shit. All right, bullies like this don't exist anymore. Exactly, <laughs> but again, this is one of those fucking eighties tropes that we get. Watching this, I'm like, this is like out of a time capsule. Like this is li- it's fucking Biff. But it would work in a different context. Yes, and I kind of like it because he gets his just desserts. But I know that I'm watching an adaption of a Japanese property. Yeah, well, that like, and this this whole scene just falls apart as soon as Light opens his mouth. Oh my god, he walks up to these bullies and he's like hey <laughs> get your damn hands off for bath the cheerleader girl is there as okay this kid's okay sorry let me back up uh these two bullies are beating the shit out of this nerd right just whooping his ass all over like really beating this kid's ass where are the adults nowhere to be found and this isn't the last time that's gonna happen either so this kid's getting his ass kicked and uh light walks over and he's about to break it up and then the cigarette smoking cheerleader runs over and like pushes the other kid and this motherfucker has the audacity to put his hands on this chick and then light's like hey hey you stop yo knock that off you stop don't do that that's that's mean nat wolf the actor who plays light is like a fucking wet towel the fucking whingiest brat i have ever seen on screen he does this entire speech where he's like he's like you were held back twice right that means you're over 18 right that means if you hit me it's child abuse right and you'll be on some kind of list right and then gets knocked the fuck out like a punk yeah because he's a fucking bowl of plain flavored oatmeal <laughs> <laughs> oh this is gonna be fun <laughs> So this kid lays this fucker out, just fucking... He just, he knocks the shit out of him. Refrigerators this kid, and he just sprawled down on the ground, and all of his uh, calculus... Uh... Okay, I'm gonna pick this apart, because we just asked, where are the fucking adults, okay? Now, if I, if, if I am in school, and I am found unconscious on the ground, black eye, and I'm not responsive, and the first thing you do is check the papers next to me, I'm gonna sue the f- fucking shit out of that school so this teacher finds light potentially concussed and she bends down and picks up the wet paper and just makes this look i'm like why is no one checking on this kid I, that's the first thing i thought of too i was like this kid just got his ass kicked Why you found a kid out cold in the rain the very next scene that i want to talk about is in the principal's office which again is indicative of that 80s feel like it's very much like yeah uh Look, I know you got your ass kicked because you're a fucking pussy, but you've been doing all this calculus homework and selling it in a goddamn schoolyard. And he's like, uh, sir, uh, what about my face? And he's like, fuck your face, you fucking loser. You Guess what? You sold all that fucking homework. Now you're getting three weeks detention. And I guess uh, this is supposed to fuel his desire for, like, justice but it's completely fucking ham-fisted then there's this like one line where he's like he's like i don't give a fuck that your mom's dead you're a little bastard now get the fuck out of my office and it's just like oh okay like that that's where we're going with this so light you know is obviously uh been scorned also i have a problem because this bully's not getting reprimanded whatsoever no yeah not at all it's assault, left him outside, and then, like, the, the boy's name isn't even mentioned. Also, it's the first sign that uh, Mia is the actual worst human being to ever walk the face of the earth. Oh, my God. We'll get to that later. Though. Later. So, he gets detention for two weeks. By the way, when I said this movie drags ass but spends no time on anything, all this happens in, like, six minutes. So, he's in detention, and the teacher's like, don't get up or else you're getting another five weeks of detention he goes home first and talks to his dad and i think they have a bit of a confrontation his mother was killed by a a 
a gangster, a something. I don't know. He's supposed yeah. to be some kind of a bad dude. Uh, in a hit and run, and because he was like a gangster, he got out of it and like lights up set because his dad's like a police chief and he thinks he didn't like try hard enough. He's like, oh, you know, you let her get away. Like you let her kill her get away. And he's like, you know, I just did my job. Supposed to be planting seeds for his desire for justice, but that all falls apart. Who is the actor who plays his dad? Because I like him a lot. He pops up in everything now. I first saw him in yeah. Boardwalk Empire and I'm like, I like him. And then now he's just, he just shows up in, in the weirdest places. His name is Shay Wiggum. That's what I thought. Him and Willem Dafoe are like the two shiny spots of this movie. Yeah, no, he's very good and I, I can't think off the top of my head right now what he's from. He was, in, he was in Kong Skull Island as of recently. He was in Skull Island. What else was he in? Oh, he was in Silver Linings Playbook. He was the brother. Yes. He's great. I like him and I think he does, he's fine even in this role. He's a good actor. I don't have a problem with him at all. He's the only person in this movie I actually, like, you can, his performance you can get behind. Because he's a fucking cop and he's like, yep, it's, this sucks. I can do nothing about my wife's killer and the, the fucking system is fucked and my son is angry about it. So then we're back at school now? In detention? Yep. If you have whiplash, that's okay. So did we. I totally forgot that scene where he went home, so put it that way. So we're in the classroom and the, and the teacher uh, leaves the room and all of a sudden it turns into the courtroom in Ghostbusters 2 and fucking... <laughs> Chairs just start going fucking flying, and the Scolari brothers are there. The Scolari brothers. I tried him for murder! <laughs> and he climbs under the fucking desk, and then uh, Ryuk's there, and he throws a fucking apple at him. God damn, Ryuk is cool. He is. He's badass, all right? He's so cool. And I, I like the fact that he's always sort of obscured by a shadow. You never get a good look at his face, which is also like to hide CGI. Like, it's to hide, like, a budget. I think it worked well. It does work well, because it's it assists his personality, because you're like, I don't really know. You can't read him at all. Right, exactly. You just see those eyes, the glowing eyes. And the shots from the back as well, too. Yeah, and his his motivations are a complete mystery. So then Ryuk shows up, and then uh, Light screams like a child. He screams like a child would if they, like, st like stepped on a thumbnail. He's basically a man. Like, he's uh, he's probably just about to turn 18, and straight up goes, ah! And then suddenly it becomes this series of like physical comedy gags where he's like fucking falling over and like doing a comedy scream for like 30 seconds. Why is this here? Uh, it's not funny. I don't I don't know. I don't know why Ryoka needed ghost powers on top of just being a god of death. Like he needed these additional powers. Why does he poltergeist the whole room? To scare him? But isn't he like trying to like kind of get on Light's good side and be like, hey... I know you want to fucking kill these kids. Yeah, I don't know. Like, not to keep referencing the book because it starts to get, like, kind of redundant at some point. No, it's fine. Like, it just, it comes across, like, in this movie, like, like in the book, he's always has his own agenda, like, at the end of the day, but he's never really, like, that benevolent about it. Whereas here, it's like the second he shows up, it's like, oh, he clearly has fucking something on his mind that he wants taken care of. Question about the source material. I heard that Ryuk kind of at some point maybe implies that like maybe light was the wrong person for the book because he's a bit too crafty see i don't remember verbatim that i totally probably happened at some point yeah like he's like maybe he's like maybe this was a bad choice not because of you know for anything negative but because he is just kind of too he's too smart and too dangerous no no he never he never takes it to that level because as far as like i remember like ryuk was kind of like happy that light is that craft because then you know the whole reason in the in the comic at least that he drops the death note into the human realm is because he's bored okay his entertainment is the way light gets in and out of these situations throughout the entire series in the movie he seems to immediately distrust light he's like eh, if you don't want it put it away no big deal he's like look you're the, you're the wrong guy for this book Ah, uh, I'm gonna give it to someone else. Look, just leave it on a desk somewhere, and then in seven days, it'll be somebody else's. Before that, we're treated to our first um, scene of completely unnecessary, over-the-top violence. Oh my god, but that's right. But Ryuk's like, look, you write a name down, and they die. And he's like, come on, you're pulling my leg. And he's like, no, really. And he's like, no, you're, no, no. No, seriously. Given the past two minutes, like, he should be taking this probably as seriously as possible. And he's like, he's like, yeah, go ahead, write his name down. He'll die. He doesn't take a second nope. to consider the fact that he's about to murder someone, does it, and then acts shocked. I'm like, motherfucker, you just did this. Yeah, and they give, they give him the old fucking omen treatment. He gets fucking David Warner straight up. Granted, this is spectacular gore. <laughs> It's awesome. The kills are awesome. The problem is they're a bit they're a bit too Rube Goldberg device Final Destination like to for me because like wasn't his signature in the in the manga like a heart attack? Yeah, they don't really go into it in the movie. Like they don't specify how this works, but in the book, it's like if you don't write down like how they're gonna die, they just die of a heart attack after I think like 
60 seconds, I think it is. Right. Okay. That's what was weird for me because I was like, wait a second. Why? Again, like Connor just said, like, why is this playing out like some weird Final Destination shit, like to make it all look like an accident? And I'm like, wait a second. Wasn't it just like a fucking, exactly, like a heart attack? To be fair, like, the, the as the series goes on, he does do a lot of shit like that. But I think they just, for the sake of, you know, a 90 minute runtime, they just decided to take that concept and kind of just put it as like the only way to kill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I think that was like the, the compromise they made rather than and having to explain it all right before this asshole dies these two kids are like physically and verbally abusing this girl outside yeah it's like outside where people can see it's broad daylight in the front of the school they've got some girl on the ground on her face they're throwing her back and forth they're dumping her shit all over the place there's kids walking down the street there's people driving by why is nobody doing anything about this and the problem is it's not even addressed like you don't see people like like it like seeing something and ignoring it because they're you know because for one reason or another or or anything it's just it's just glossed over until he kills him and then all of a sudden there's kids bouncing the basketball and somebody driving and this one driving those two fucking grown boys are beating the shit out of that girl no big deal oh my god a ladder sawed that guy's head in half yeah i mean look he again he got his just desserts but how, how come he was not stopped from doing this like earlier when his fucking head bounced off the ground and just like just goo went everywhere i was giggling my ass off oh yeah absolutely i mean i felt good about that one i mean i guess you're supposed to because most of the people who die in this are, are real pieces of shit so like commits his first murder and he basically almost gets sick and that's when ryuk is like hey look i'll take the book somewhere else you don't have to keep it and then he for some reason does i'll give it to harry osborne <laughs> <laughs> and then i think we go home again Oh, actually, actually, uh, one more thing. I wrote this down. The line about a shark attack on the toe. Oh, that's right. He does go home, and that's when he uh, appears again. Uh, they have a conversation, and he's like, he explains the rules about the book, and the 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 rules become problematic because it seems like they just make them up as they go along. Which is another problem because it's all fucking laid out for you. It's all laid out. You don't. There, there's no guesswork here. You're you're making this shitty. Well, I think it's another case. Like, and there's a lot of this in this movie where it's like in the manga. You know, he's got X amount of, 12, like I said, 12 volumes to basically have light figure out, like, 90% of the tricks. Whereas in a movie, it's like, you know, he doesn't have time for that to happen. So instead, he's just like... Yeah, in, like, a 12-volume series, he has the learning curve to adjust to and get and like, settle into how the book works. This, he just... Ha he has to have this, and this is just fucking, like, yeah, exposition yeah. jackhammers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, Ryuk wrote it in the book already, whereas in the show, it's over, like, several years. He's like, oh, what if I try this? And then it's like, oh, that works, or oh, that doesn't work. Whereas this, it's like, you don't have time for that. Like, you, there's, there's not enough time in the movie. Yeah, so there's no growth. It's detrimental to everything. We have plenty of time for that. But instead of doing a Ryuk light, scenes and, and and exposition that way for some fucking reason we have this girl this love interest Ugh, oh before we get to that i do want to mention the line from ryo got a good chuckle to me when he's like ask be realistic you can't have a shark attack happen in the toilet i'm like i would pay to see that happen right now even he's like yeah and i'd like to see that too i know i would fucking that would make this movie infinitely better he does use the death note one more time oh yes this is this is important to uh basically to kill the guy who killed his mother and it's immediately after another conversation about like about how they're handling it correct yeah that's why i didn't catch it the first time yeah it's it's how his dad's handling it and how like he's his wife's killer's out there and he can do nothing about it and lights all bitter like we said before so he runs into his dad's safe or something i'm not sure how exactly he gets this fucking batch of newspapers yeah it's out of like his office or is safe or something and then like basically commits his first like major major i mean the kid in the street is major but this is this is plot moving he writes the you know the guy who killed his mother writes his name down and then he dies in a hilarious sequence where someone trips on a salt shaker they bump into him and he stabs himself in the throat with his own fucking fork it's also disgusting because like he's what is he he stabs himself and then just spits up all the fucking food and shit he had in his mouth with the blood <laughs> It's like a blood explosion right out of his mouth. Collapses? I'm like, that was gross. It's also, again, hilarious looking just because when you describe it to someone, how'd he die? Well, see this waiter over here. Uh, he was minding his own business. And then a salt shaker uh, appeared from nowhere. Did Light write that down? Like... And then the waiter slipped on the salt, and then he fell into the chair, and then bumped the guy's head with his tray, and then he fell on the knife, and it killed him in his throat. I'm just imagining Ryuk, like, in the room, like, all right, let's get the logistics here. Who's standing where? How the fuck is that gonna work, Light? I don't understand. <laughs> 
can't, I can't just drop a chandelier at him. That's too boring. It's got to be realistic. Remember, I would love actually if it was just like showed him at dinner. There's nothing happening, and then mid sentence, a chandelier just falls on him. How about I go in dressed as a woman and I shoot the shit out of him? <laughs> now we're reintroduced to Mia, and Light does the dumbest thing in the whole movie. Oh my. God. Uh, it's up there at least this can be summed up as hey girl i have a death god want to fuck that's literally what it is but she's totally into it she's like oh i want to fucking kill some people and fuck first of all there's several red flags that pop up every time mia shows up like your first red flag was that she left you outside in the rain after you got decked in the face your second red flag is i have a death god show me he's at school she fucking walks up to him and she sees him because he's got the fucking book out in gym class I'm like what the fuck sitting by himself on the bleachers looking like a potential school shooter creeping on the fucking cheerleaders which is really bizarre i just couldn't believe he had the book out in public i was like so like that is like so bad he's supposed to be intelligent at least we're led to believe that and he just makes like stupid decision after stupid he decision he knows the fucking book works and he's just like ah eh, fuck it i'm just gonna whoop it out right here so he tries to convince her he's like he's like all right you see this book look will Defoe is right behind you. Turn around. And she's like, uh, I don't fucking see anything. That scene was annoying because I think that was like a joke about the original source material. Because in the original, if I'm remembering correctly, if you just touch the death note, you can see like the death god. See, that's interesting. They didn't want to have to bother with the continuity or somebody grabbing the fucking book because they're lazy. Okay. Exactly. I mean, I could be mistaken. I could be misremembering, but I'm almost positive that's how it was in the original. From what I understand, the holder of the note in the original was like five people deep, like in the series. Because I think like it's like because I think I saw someone tally up like the total body count between all the holders of the death note in the series which is a staggering body count by the way i don't know if this is meant to be awkward but it's painfully awkward like when he stands there in his empty room and goes i have a death god i would have turned around and left the room and forgot that boy existed she's like prove it to me and he's like okay ah uh, let's 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 okay let's go on the computer and see what's going on in the news oh look a hostage situation timed perfectly for <laughs> i was like oh look okay here's a hostage situation that's going on live okay okay what's this guy's name okay this is what he looks like okay all right watch this and then he like writes some shit down and then this this guy walks out with a hostage and lets the hostage go and does like an army salute and gets fucking hammered by a fucking police uh tactical vehicle utterly annihilated by a swat truck who yeah, SWAT truck. Let's let's address this truck for a second. This was not a tight turn that this truck made. This truck barreled at this dude. It was like the fucking steamroller sequence from Austin Powers. Didn't we just reference this last episode too? We we did. Yes, we did. Yeah, this is exactly what that is. Like, except this time it's the steamroller's fault. It goes from zero to eighty in five <laughs> seconds and just nails this guy. Like, where was it coming from? He takes a few seconds to like walk out in the street, stand there, salute, and this SWAT truck just is like. Uh, well, it, it, it's his day. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. It looks neat, but it's like, where? Why? The gore in this movie is spectacular. It's he he turns into just a, this mess of like blood and limbs, and it's shot and like for a split second, it's like slowed down so you can kind of see like he's just he's bursting at the seams. I, I'm gonna assume that a lot of that is like practical mixed with digital, and it looked really great. I mean, it looks awesome. It looks it looks it looks practical. It looks like someone ran the fuck out of a ballistics dummy. Yeah, especially the way like it breaks up. So I thought that was cool. Light proves to Mia that this is the power he has. She's like, have my babies. And then fucking, there's a tsunami in her drawers, and she's like, I gotta fuck this guy now. There is a montage of them fucking and killing people. Okay, hot take, this montage is worse than the one in Watchmen. <laughs> This is this is the worst uh, 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 fuck montage in the history of cinema. Uh, I you know we, I have to disagree with that. That one in the fucking Twin Peaks Return was pretty much the worst thing I had to sit through. With fucking uh, Kyle MacLachlan and um. Yeah, it was like for like three minutes straight. It was like way too long. Oh my god! And just it's just a static shot of Kyle MacLachlan looking derpy as fuck. So, yeah, they had this overlong, like, they're basically just boyfriend and girlfriend now after having no previous, like, they don't go on dates. They don't do anything. They're just like, hi, we're exclusive now, even though we don't know each other. Yeah, but the big problem here is that she is the catalyst in the killing situation. It's supposed to be light, and he's supposed to be killing these people because he wants to do good. Mia is a vast detriment to 
everything in this movie. She's a fucking sadist. She just wants to see people die. And then, like, after these two become an item, you're like, this is it. These are my protagonists, and they both suck. It's just so fucking <laughs> stupid. Like, there's there's no reason to invest in any movie because you're like, Mia is terrible. Uh, I, I immediately hope she dies. And Light is a fool. And you're like, please, just be better than what you are. And it, it never fucking comes out that way. And so the whole movie, they're just like, they're both awful. They're both awful. They're both awful. That's it. The next time we see them, like, together for the next, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour, they're like half kissing and half, like, talking about fucking killing somebody. You're like, oh, uh, yeah, this guy am um, on the fucking, yeah, yeah, dead. and then they fucking die, and then in goes the fucking dick. Then they're fucking. And it's like, what? Dude. Heads up, there's some fucking sick shit going on here. The visual implication is like, these two are literally being turned on by the idea of murdering someone from halfway across the world. She gets off on it. God, I love violence. She's going to fucking agrish.com and then fucking going to town. Uh, so this goes on for quite a few minutes. It's a montage that I believe leads us right into our introduction <laughs> to hell. <laughs> oh my god, I'm perched on my chair right now, by the way, <laughs> recording this. Eating my fucking candy out of a bowl. Oh... Oh my god, um, L is the source of unintentional comedy for the rest of the movie, and that's a shame because he's supposed to be this, like, dramatic foil for Light, and he just ends up as this fucking clown. Well, well, when you think about that, though, Connor, like, Light kind of got turned into a clown in this film anyway, so maybe he is the right foil for Now him. we have a third, a third protagonist slash antagonist, and you're like, again, he's a, like, he's it's unlikable, he's kind of weird in the wrong ways, and the longer it goes, like, the more holes in his character start to show, like, he starts out, like, when you see him as, like, okay, I, from my understanding, he's supposed to be, like, some fucking uber detective, um, who, like, d doesn't sleep. Yeah. He's like a, the equivalent of like a Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, he's like fucking Batman or some shit. One of the world's best detectives. That's the point where he's like an urban legend among the police force because that's a, I. It was a line I missed the first time where later on they're talking about him to Light's dad and he's like, "Hell's real." I'm like, I'm like, huh, world building. He's so goddamn corny. Like, this is the biggest departure, I feel like, from the original source material. Like, L, uh, again, like like Sean said, like, L is this fucking badass Sherlock Holmes-esque character who puts a lot of thought, obviously, into what he's doing. He's like some young kid, like, who gets, like, sugar highs, and he's just like, ah, the fucking, the hypotenuse of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. He's twitchy and kind of paranoid. Bizarre isn't a good enough word for it, but that, we get later. Layers of this layer on again, more holes start to show. His manservant needs to make sure he gets enough sleep. We meet L after like a long montage of like, oh, we glossed over the whole Kira thing. They come up with a name for their killings and they use the name. Okay, first of all, like, why would you use a word that in another language just means your name? How stupid do you have to be? Yeah, but he's just like, ah, in Russian and Celtic, it means it means light, but in Japanese, it means killer. Wink. Fucking wink. Which is like the laziest way to tie this back to the source material. It's like, guess where it came from? <laughs> Remember that other thing that you wish you were watching? Guess what? You're not getting it here. So we have this like long kind of scene where throughout the world, like they're using the death note to kill. You're killing prisoners? They're already in prison. <laughs> like he kills a bunch of like crazy dictators that are doing awful things to people. And it's like, okay, that's kind of cool. But then uh, he kills these prisoners that God knows what these people did. First of all, second of all, they're writing his fucking name in Japanese on the wall? There's something about this whole Kira thing that bothers me. No one in the movie handles this with the amount of profound panic they should be handling. Like, you're telling me that, like, around the world, there are killings being committed. No one knows how they're being done. No one has any evidence of how they're being done. There's no suspects. There's literally nothing. And everyone's like... Well, the Kira killings happen again. Motherfucker, people are being killed by ghosts. There's no insinuation of divine presence, which is weird. If this was happening in the streets nowadays, dude, there'd be people in the fucking corners with signs about the apocalypse. Like, I don't have no clue why people in this movie think that it's a person doing it. They keep, yeah, they constantly refer to Kira as, like, mostly a he or a, a person, but sometimes, like, they say it. I'm like, no one has, behind the scenes and in the movie, nobody has a single idea of what this concept actually is. But there should be some kind of cult if you're gonna do that. Like, there's a cult that worships Kira because Kira is, like, this supernatural being that is making these people kill themselves. You're supposed to be led to believe that Elle is, again, a crazy good detective. But, like, right away, you're like, this dude just jumps to conclusions because he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I fed out some information on the criminal database and I know exactly what's happening. When did you do this? I don't I, he it seems like his character always knows more than what we should know as a viewer. He just comes out and he's like, "Oh yeah, 
lights Kira. How the fuck do you know that? Without any explanation. Well, he kind of explains it in the diner. You know, not to repeat myself, but it's like the biggest problem with this movie is you're trying to take 12 volumes of material and fucking like adapt it to a movie. And it's like, granted, it's probably like realistically like maybe let's say even it was a like half of it just for the sake of argument even though it's so drastically different. It's like, that's still a lot of material. So it's like, yeah, they have the stuff with the people killing themselves in the jail. And like the whole point with that was like him basically announcing his presence. So people know it's a person or a thing. Right. But that's glossed right over. Yeah. But it's, it just, it happens so quick because it's literally in a montage scene while, like you said, they're hooking up. So it, it, it's just like, you know, there's not as much weight put into it. Like, yeah, they say that over 400 people have been killed and yeah, like it's a national epidemic and, you know, his dad, you know, is the only cop in Seattle that still like takes the case seriously that's what i'm saying it should be light and ryuk like they should be together in this month they should have a montage together feeding each other different lines of exposition right the lines that lighter light is saying to mia feel like they should be to ryuk and a bit of like kind of voiceover these people need someone they can look to and like they'll, they'll know that like you know fucking evil will be punished like that it feels like the end of a different movie it feels like the resolution to like the rise of what would be Kira. I'm like, so they like this is it? They're just celebrating already? We're a half hour in. Yeah, that that was also the crazy part. I was like, it's only this far in, and I'm like, what? Why did we rush through all of that? Yeah, we're 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 like maybe a half hour, forty minutes in, probably not even forty minutes in, and we're already at global epidemic of deaths. So yeah, L comes to wherever the fuck this city is after after being at a, a crime scene in Japan where uh I mean I guess uh, strippers also count as horrible evil people. What the fuck? That scene is so fucking bad, and they're like, oh well, uh, I can see them like, oh well, we need a scene in Japan because like the, the anime's for and the, and the manga's from Japan. We also really need tits for some reason. All over the place and butts. I'm like, okay, he's punishing evil people, but he just like, are you telling me he they like single handedly slaughtered an entire strip club full of people? I'm sure not all of them were criminals. Where the fuck did he get that intel from? So the only way that that would even make sense is if he had like one dude's name and he's like, all right, you're going to kill all of these people and then yourself. May maybe. But again, it's it's just glossed over. Yeah, but we're also introduced to his manservant, babysitter, uh, caretaker, slash, I don't know what the hell he is, uh, Watari, who's a cool character. He's his lover, as we find out later. Yeah, like... <laughs> Or something. I'm not even sure what the hell he's supposed to be. Kind of like his Alfred type character, essentially. I guess. I guess they assign that to you at this fucking abandoned base. Oh, this is so stupid. This fucking made me so mad. It's almost not even worth talking about because it's just, it's, it's so, it, they hand wave it away so fast that you forget he was even mentioned. Watari basically explains that, like, this dude will, like, stay up for 44 hours and just basically keep himself going on sugar highs and then, like, sleeps an hour and then goes another two days and just sounds nuts. Uh, and then he goes to wherever the hell this, again, wherever the hell this movie takes place in. Seattle. And just, like, immediately goes and has a, a fucking non face to face with Light's dad through a computer. And then doesn't he just show up right afterwards? I think he's there. He's just, like, in a different room, isn't he? Yeah, because he's he's intent on not showing anybody's face. He has his turtleneck pulled up all the way over his nose, and he constantly has a hood on. Um, he looks like a ninja. Yeah, he looks like a ninja. Which is fine, because L like, figures that out, that, like, but it's so stupid in the movie, like, it doesn't make any sense. But again, he does, we're not shown how he knows this, because that leads right into the next scene, where he goes out, and he addresses Kira, again, addresses Kira as a person, not an entity, not a force, not a, not a group, nothing. It's a he. Everyone's convinced it's a he. I guess because he doesn't believe in Supernatural, but there are definitely supernatural elements here that are happening yeah it's completely unexplainable yeah and i think it, that's the whole point he's trying to prove is like yeah i know it's human and i'm gonna prove it and he does the press conference and when like he's not immediately killed he's like yeah like they need to know more information than i think we realize and that's why i wasn't killed right then and there because he doesn't know my name and he can't clearly see my face so like yeah he is he is jumping to conclusions but like he has like you know and maybe I'm just giving it too much credit because I read the source material, but, like, he has, like, a, some... There is logic to where he's coming from. It's just, like, it's not really represented super well on the screen. No, not at all. It's... it's No. He... We're told he knows things, and we just have to accept that he knows these things, but we're not given any indication of him doing, like, research, investigating, like, detective work. We get, like, five minutes of that when he's talking to the dad, and he's like, oh, this is... I, I, I went through all these papers and all this shit and all this blah, 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 blah. But I think, like, you know, they kind of do that intentionally, and as almost like a plot point for the film where it's like they go out of their way to not show him do any of this investigative work they make a point that he just shows up and kind of has these opinions already because by the end of the movie none of the like if by the end of the manga and the anime like all the cops are like fucking with l like yeah we're gonna solve this case but by the end of this movie they're like get the fuck out of here 
Like we don't we don't yeah, believe you. You. <laughs> you fucking psycho. Yeah. So it's like it's almost like the way that this movie was written was intended to be like, yeah, he's super smart, and we just got to take his word for it. But we don't really actually know why he's super smart. Even if he brings light in, how the fuck is he going to prove that light killed all these people? There's no there's no evidence. That's the I was about. That's literally the words of mouth. That's the problem with this whole identifying Kira as a person. You can't like how the fuck is that going to hold up in court? This person did it. How how did he how did he kill? Uh, how did he kill a fucking Chinese, Vietnamese, whatever the fuck it was, dictator, when he has, like, a concrete alibi of being thousands of miles across the ocean? Nobody would back it. I guess that's why L it spirals into kind of, like, insanity, and he, like, he knows that Light has done it, but he doesn't know how, and he wants to kill him, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that later, because the, 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 the cafe scene is really cool. We'll get to that a little later. It's actually pretty well, well written. I, I actually like that scene. I like that sequence a lot. I do, too. A few minutes later, isn't he just like, yeah, Light's heard his Kira. So L holds the press conference and he, he isn't killed and he kind of like proves his point to Light's dad and uh, he has someone follow Light because he's kind of narrated it down to... Yeah, but that's so stupid though. He's just like, yeah, I got a tail on your kid. And he's like, what the fuck? Leave my kid alone. Yeah. And then he's like, well, actually, we had a tail on you for two weeks, but you just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. L's also kind of a dick. <laughs> I do like how some people in this movie go from, like, zero to a hundred angry reactions, and Light's dad's one of them. Yeah, he's the one most of the time. That's what happens when you have no setup. Blows up on a pin drop. Yeah, I think that's part of that is, like, some of the stuff they did get right with L's character from the manga is, like, you know, the way he sits in a chair, the way he hands, like, the files to James, uh, you know. Yeah, just kind of, like, dropping them and stuff like that. Like, I, I th that's fine, but it just doesn't... It doesn't work for this, though. Yeah, and I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, I think the fact that he is rude is supposed to be, like, his character quirk is that he's just, like, very socially awkward. Yeah. Whether that actually comes across or not, that that's nor here nor there. Uh, okay, yeah, now I remember. We're treated to uh, Mia and Light basically having to go on the down low because they're being tailed. Mia suggests killing FBI agents because if you haven't come to the conclusion yet that she's not right in the head, this is red flag number three. This is a big plot point because before that happens, or, or right after that happens, Light's dad uh, comes out to speak about about Kira, and he's like, all right, Kira, he's like, you know, you killed these fucking men, that's awful, and uh, turn yourself in, or whatever, or we're, we're coming after you, don't worry, we're gonna get you, and then Elle's like, hmm, I wonder how long it's gonna take for you to die, and then that's kind of how Elle puts those pieces together, that Light is the killer yeah i mean it's like he has a hunch so he ha purposely has his dad make that speech and like mia is even like dude you gotta kill him or else it's obvious that you're kira yeah but like she's like you gotta kill your dad and i'm like what the fuck she suggests killing six fbi agents and then suggests killing her boyfriend's dad red flag number four but at the same time She's 100% fucking right. Not to kill his dad. Well, we know how this movie ends, so maybe he should have. <laughs> well, I guess, but <laughs> what she says to him is, Kira needs to keep going, and now we're going to show lack of backbone or some shit like that. Not like, well, it's your dad, and they're going to find, and Elle's going to find out that it's you. It's, we got to keep killing people or else everybody's not going to believe us. Yeah. Mia is an unrelentingly selfish person. Oh my god, so much. And then here's the scene where she clearly steals the death note, but it's not revealed for like 40 minutes later into the film. Oh, fuck. Fuck. We're talking about the film you've already, everyone's probably already seen. She steals a death note because after, uh, I think before the, the dad sequence, like, we're treated to the six FBI agents running up a building, jumping off, killing themselves, and... No, uh, it's, it's, it's after that. Okay, and then, yeah, and then the, uh, the, what is it, the head of the FBI, or, like, his dad's boss, like, just drops dead of a heart attack in a stairwell? Yeah. That's first, and then the FBI agents kill themselves, because L's like, oh, shit, that fucking guy died, and then he calls the FBI agent, and he's like, look, you need to regroup, like, right now, and then he, like, drops his phone and then they all walk up to the thing and jump off the building light doesn't want to kill anybody because he feels they're on his case mia's like we need to do it she walks out after like she argues with him that we're not killing anyone this is bad and it's like to me it was obvious as hell that she took the book with her but he thinks ryuk is the one that killed all the fbi agents as like a fuck you to him for not using it for like a week and then you're right then you do see the dad come out and he doesn't kill him and that's when mia's kind of like hey like, he's going to know it's you. And he's like, eh. And then the next the next scene is L. Light Turner is, is Kira. Pretty much. We're, we're rushing to get from point A to point B, and that's why. Well, it's just so, again, the movie does too. But there's a line in here from Ryuk that's probably my favorite line from the movie is, L is like, uh, hey, if you, if you pull this kind of shit again, I'll put your name in the book. Ryuk laughs, drops an apple, and says, my name has four letters. The most anyone's ever gotten is two. Good luck. And it's fucking badass. I was like, that'd put the fear of God in me real quick. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like, wow, that was a cool scene. 
All right, now here's a bunch of garbage. <laughs> It's like every Ryuk scene, though. Yeah, Mia steals the book, and then, like, uh, the rest of this movie is a fucking train wreck. Well, she steals it, but then she must put it back, because there's at no point does he ever, like, realize that it was missing. She doesn't take it until the until Elle raids the house. Oh, no, what is she takes a page out of it, I guess is what it is. That's what she does. She takes a page. What happens is they're like, fuck, we gotta kill this L guy. So then that's when he finds out the name and the face of uh, his right-hand man, his manservant, and he basically is like, he writes down in the book, like, hey... You're going to get up. You're going to go find me L's name so I can write it down in this book and kill him. Again, but it's it's more expository. Here's some rules you didn't know about before. Like, suddenly he has the powers of, like, just fucking just ultimate suggestion. Like, he can just control someone for a few days. Well, yeah, and then he calls him on the fucking telephone, and he's like, he's like, hey, are you fucking there yet or what? Yeah, it's just, it's bizarrely handled. It, again, like, Ryuk's purpose, like, aside from kind of dropping cool lines every once in a while, it seems to be, like, just the tool to dispose plot points. He's just like, blah, here's how everything works. Not to backpedal, but before the before he basically mind controls Watari is that diner scene, or the, yes, the cafe yes. scene, okay. rather. This is probably the best part of the film. It's the best interaction between the two characters, for sure. I mean, Elle starts the conversation off basically being like, hey, I know it's you. And he's still masked, by the way. You need to you need to explain, like, why you did this. And then Light just basically being like, oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Light tries to kind of deflect and then I can't remember what L says that makes him come back to the table. And then we're seeing, like, layers of light we're never treated to again, where it's like, he is, like, he comes at what he probably knows is, like, an intellectual superior with balls. Exactly, but that's the whole, that's supposed to be the point. And then we're never, we never get that dynamic again, except right here. He's like, this is so beyond you, it would blow your mind. And L is like, okay, yeah, I kind of know it's you, but my thirst for knowledge of how this is happening is kind of superseding my desire to put you in jail. Well, because if he doesn't know how he's doing it... He can't put him in jail. Yeah, because he says, I'm all about check, not checkmate. No, no, I'm all about checkmate, not check. Yeah, there we go. Because he has him, but he do he needs concrete. He can't get him. I, I do like when he, he... I think it's when, like... I can't remember what Light says, but he, like, snaps and grabs a fork off the table in kind of a threatening way, and then kind of goes off, like, you know, I don't carry a gun, it's distracting, I don't kill, uh, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then, like, when he just, like... But you're going down. Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, but and when he fucking just, like, clears a table off, I'm like, God, this scene is so good. <laughs> <laughs> he was making a point about, you know, because Light's saying, oh, you know, what's so bad about Kira? Like, he's just killing bad people. Like, I don't know what the problem is. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And L, like... He's suggesting a team up or some shit. Well, no, he's just saying, I don't know why he's so bad. Like, I don't know why you guys are trying to put him away. And, and L is kind of like, well, you know, when you kill, you know, 400 people, and then he, like, knocks everything off the table, kind of, like, as an emphasis of for the 400. He's like, we of course we're going to try to catch you. Like, Yeah, but then L, I mean, Light tries to coerce... L and he's like more in so many words he's like I'll tell you how I do it if you want to team up with me and we'll kill some bad guys <laughs> right okay yeah I could see that which again it's it was like the fucking it, I don't want to compare it to like the one scene in Heat that where uh because that's com like comparing a turd to a golden nugget it's a fucking cool scene where you have the two two foes having like a battle of wits just you know and they they have to walk away without actually coming to blows or anything because the situation is too complex it's great and then and then everything else after this is ooh, 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 it's a circus. <laughs> it's Sherlock and Moriarty. That's what's going on here. Yes. But it's kind of like telling it from Moriarty's point of view if he was an anti-hero. Kind of? Sort of? Anyway, I, 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 think, I think that's kind of a fair parallel. Sort of. Yeah. That's what I was told it was supposed to be anyway. And now, I think now we go to uh, the winter formal. Is this, this is where the dance scene? Uh, not quite. First you have, you know, the, the scene with Batari basically drives off and he's got to go to the, the orphanage because he doesn't have a record of L's name. The whole time he's acting like a fucking programmed lore robot. <laughs> He's like, oh, yes, these orphans who were sent to a secret compound somewhere, <laughs> and they were raised from birth to be super detectives. Is this going to be brought up ever again? No? Cool, thanks. We get to this fucking uh, hidden base. He's like, I don't even know if I can find it because it was so well hidden, but I'm going. And he gets there. <laughs> I, it's so well hidden, I don't know if I can find it. There it is. But, like, this place has clearly been abandoned for decades. A long time. <laughs> And L's supposed to be, like, what, in his mid-20s? Maybe, if that. Like, this looks like some... This looks like it was abandoned in the 1700s. What the fuck? What the fuck? What are we trying to do here? Well, it, it doesn't help that this place looks abandoned. Watari found it. And then Watari's ultimate demise is that at, <laughs> an armed guard teleports from nowhere. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's Ryuk, and he's like, he's like, Player's Choice, or whatever the fuck he is. Kids Choice Awards. Viewer's Choice. Because basically the way that that works is Light has a rule he finds where for 48 hours you can control a person, to, you know, depending on what you write in the book. And, uh, you know, if he burns that page um before the time limit then watari will snap out of it and he won't die and you know ryuk says oh if you don't write down you know type of the way they die it'll you know it you know anything could happen so yeah he you know like goes uh dealer's choice yeah dealer's choice and uh so so that happens and watari you know he goes off on his little adventure and l basically can't get contact with him oh boy and he talks about how you know, he's known him his whole life. This would never happen. Something's fucking wrong. So he goes, he goes to Light's house and he's like, dude, we got a search warrant. Like we're fucking, we're going to find out what you did. And his dad, uh, Light's dad gets so pissed. He leaps across the table. I laughed so fucking hard every time I watched the sequence. He, he jumps across the table, grabs L by the throat and puts him in like a legitimate headlock slash chokehold against this like wooden table and light is like l is like struggling to get his lines out <laughs> he's like oh your son's gear at that <laughs> he's like you stay away fuck away from my son you son of a bitch i have a search warrant <laughs> i don't give a shit uh real quick let it be known that you can only burn a page with somebody's name on it one time it only works once so you can't write somebody's name down and be like oh shit i don't want to do that and just burn the page it only will have you can only do it once per customer which i was totally waiting and they didn't do this but i was waiting for him to burn it and then like it not to happen because he'd be like well that's not the first person that's ripped a page out of it that would have been great it would have been good and he'd be like Haha, fuck you pumpkin bomb deal is choice so then yeah they start getting ready for the prom um basically the house gets raided and he thinks the death notes got stolen but mia took it with her and she hands him this fucking dorky looking hat and inside there's a note that says i have the book so uh he's he's all relieved and then he he calls watari and like joe kind of said watari never actually finds the information that he was looking for in his time quote unquote runs out he keeps saying he doesn't know where it is but he keeps going to exactly where it is he's like i i don't know where this file is but i'm gonna look in this filing cabinet exactly where it is i don't see it but here it right is <laughs> even if it's dior's choice with ryuk and like it's somehow influenced by him the idea of like a fully like he first of all he looks like he's in full swat gear and like a machine like an automatic rifle just appears like a fucking virtual cop enemy like <laughs> <laughs> reload reload are you atari bam 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 and the whole crux of this situation is you know light basically is at the dance and uh you know l steals a police car because he can't get in touch with with, with atari and he's basically like fuck this like my best friend is basically dead um and he fucking speeds off and lights like lights bugging out because uh mia basically says to him hey I need the death note. Like, I want it. You need to go get it for me because otherwise this thing's going to happen. Oh, because she, she writes his name in the book because she stole the page, right? Well, we'll get to we'll get to that. Can we talk about L driving this fucking cop car? <laughs> okay, I was, I'm glad we, because we, I almost brought this up. Can we talk about how we, there's a precise moment in this movie where you can watch his character from a writing perspective break in half? He, he goes from this kind of like, collected if eccentric super detective to a a quivering lipped look like he's about to cry twitchy wacko the rest of the movie he's on a fucking sugar high and he's driving this car and he's like ah fuck i'm gonna kill you light you son of a bitch fucking insane the rest of the film he's fucking hitting lampposts and mailboxes and pedestrians he's like i don't kill and then runs a cop car through a bus stop he also has a gun by the way yeah from blade runner yeah he has a fucking decker special man he's fucking gonna pop some replicants you mean baby's first pew pew sci-fi pistol that thing made me laugh so hard dude it looks like the fucking gun from blade runner i was like why isn't it just a regular pistol why does it have to look like that because stupid shit there's this weird emphasis put on the fact that the gun is in the box but i forgot that he mentioned earlier that he says he doesn't carry guns but then when he opens the box i'm like it looks like a literal toy gun yeah but matari has two of them like in a box and like matari carries it i'm pretty sure i know that it, it comes out before 
with this scene because you see it twice oh like that briefcase he has i think yeah you're right yeah so light gets all this information from mia and then uh, this is it's just it's almost hard to keep track of all the shit that is firing off at once here because it seems like too many things come to a head at once let's back it up a little because i think we kind of like jumped around a little too much there so basically i think what happens is she basically says you know um i need the death note i want the death note he goes to get it and he can't find the fucking page with watari's name on it watari gets killed then he grabs the death note goes back to her and it was like hey why'd you take the page like like super pissed off and she's like oh because i wrote your name down on it and we can only burn one page so give me give me the fucking book or you're gonna die so then he freaks out l's driving around in the cop car going full gta then light goes to the computer lab and he's like looking up cop information on the cop database again and like writing shit in the death note and then he just texts me and meet me at the ferris wheel when we find out what he wrote down I was like, you have got to be shitting me. He had like fucking three minutes not even to do all this shit. And I'm like, are you fucking, are you kidding? We'll try to explain that away when we get to that because it's overly complicated. You can't. It's just, it's fucking dumb. Who was like, yeah, this makes sense. Perfect. He texts me and says, hey, meet me at the Ferris wheel, which has been brought up before. It's been, they've had conversations before. And then we get the most hilarious chase sequence I have seen in quite a long time where for some reason they had, like, L first starts out running like the T-1000 and Light is running like a chicken that's just been decapitated like his arms are flailing all over the place he's just like constantly tripping it just like <laughs> but he's saying shit like oh ah, ah, sorry <laughs> it's comical and then like when it, i think anytime l was supposed to look coordinated and cool he comes off looking goofy as shit like when he jumped the counter in that bar like he kind of just like casually and sloppily knocks over a bottle of mustard and then like jumps on the thing doesn't look like he's very balanced like bumps into somebody and then just hops off i'm like he sticks some guy's face in like a bowl of soup he looked like he failed a qte moment in like heavy rain or some shit like that. <laughs> Shenmue 3 coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he didn't press X in time and just fumbled. Nope, the fucking, the little timer went out. Okay, with this chase scene real quick, like, as stupid as these characters are acting, like, as silly as they're running, like, it's actually really well filmed. Uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna get to that when we got, uh, this, there are moments in this film that are just, that look really pretty. Wingard is a competent director, like, he can make some good shit. That's what pisses me off, is that I'm like, this movie is filmed gorgeously, like, he uses neon lighting in a very cool way, and he picks and chooses like you know very specific colors it seems for certain scenes like i know the uh the, the the cafe scene was basically all lit with like this kind of dim blue neon light yeah the cinematography is great like the way that the shots are framed are like really uh, like spot on again if this was anything else like if this was original story like i would have really enjoyed watching this you said it's beautifully shot like i think there's a horizontal panning shot of like of l running after light and it's like it's this long almost old boy-esque kind of uh uh almost panoramic view of like the two of them just running along a straight line it's right in the middle of the screen it's very cool looking absolutely it's good stuff we get to the end of the road with them l, l basically corners light with, with his gun and he's basically you know getting him to admit that he did it instead of getting an explanation from light he gets i did not have to take a calculus book I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. He mentions a calculus book. And then some guy basically goes out from his work, uh, you know, some fucking cook comes out to do a, have a smoke break. And, uh, you know, L goes, oh, this guy's Kira, you know, stand back. And of course, like the most telegraph thing happens. The guy like hits L with like a two by four and is like, praise Kira. Yeah, and it's like, oh, well, thanks a lot. See you later. <laughs> He grabs his gun and runs with, to the Ferris wheel. With the Blade Runner gun. Local police are officers are after L. Light is running, running from L to get to the Ferris wheel where Mia is waiting. Good God. But I also think that Light is under the impression that they know it's him when really they just are trying to actually be his bodyguard because they, they think L's out to kill him. Right. And, and his dad's like, look, L has tried to harm my son already, so we gotta go save my kid, and L, like, L's, L's unhinged. Yeah, it's like the only person in the situation who's in the right is Light's dad. They get to the Ferris wheel, which is fucking so bizarre, because I, like, was just there a few months ago. Really? Where is this filmed? It's in Seattle. That is in Seattle. Holy shit. That is the Great Wheel. Even the fucking hot dog stand that's in the background, like, I was there. I, I went to that hot dog stand. Wow, that's nice. interesting. Yeah, it's really weird. So, Light runs up to me and says, get in, and then he looks at the ride up and goes, give me to the top right now. <laughs> <laughs> Put me to the top of the very 
it's real now. And then the guy's like, I'm sorry, excuse me, slow down. He's like, I take it. the guy starts the Ferris wheel, says, get me to the top. He pushes the guy away and then L fucking fires his pew pew pistol into the control panel. He shoots the controller. Like if he shot that, the ride would just shut yeah, down. Yeah, he fucking, it, it, would, <laughs> it wouldn't go anywhere. It wouldn't break. Yeah, no, it'd just be like, <laughs> ah, fuck. It'd be a hilarious sequence where he's like, take us to the top. Ooh, they're like two cars up. It's like, we can get you with a ladder. Here, just just hop down, light. It's okay. It's like a four foot drop. When you're in that fucking thing, dude, it's it's high. Like it's scary as fuck. Oh, I'm sure it is. I don't fucking do Ferris wheels or roller coasters. I'm afraid of heights. When we get to it, like right here, where they're like falling out of it, like that was resonating with me because I was like thinking about that while I was on it. Oh no, dude, trust me, because I don't like heights and I don't I don't like open water or heights. So I'm like, oh god, look at this. It's right on the water. Yeah. Then they get to the top. And then I guess you could say they have a conversation, but what really is, is if you just kind of listen to it for it's what like basically is, it's just two cats hissing at each other for two minutes. That's all this is. They just, they bitch at each other about who, like the fucking Light's name in the book. And then he wrote her name in the book because she wrote his name in the book. And then they argue like idiots for a few minutes. Well, it was like this trust thing where like, he was like, look, if you love me, please don't take the book. And then she just like, He's like, fuck you. And he's like, ah, you fucked it up. I wrote your name down, but only if you took the book. That would mean that you would die, but now you're going to die. And she's like, oh, shit. But he outsmarts the worst person in the movie. <laughs> so she takes the book, and they're destined to die. Now Ryuk's like, ah, oh, great. Now I get to fucking destroy this Ferris wheel. Which was stupid as hell. That was the thing that, like, really pissed me off. I'm just like, why couldn't it just, like, if you're going to go full, like, everything's an accident, like, why does he even have to be involved? Why isn't it just, like, like kind of like Final Destination? It looks like it, like, it mysteriously just falls apart. I mean, he did shoot the control panel. Why can't we just go with that? Yeah, instead, Ryuk's up there doing his best fucking sell impression when he's building the goddamn world tournament. <laughs> <laughs> He's over there fucking slicing and dicing while lights hanging on for dear life. He is going full Yoda on the fucking Ferris wheel. He's just like with his big ass fingers, just like ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. we just keep changing the fucking rules, and it's like oh, what? Yeah, because then it implies that like Ryuk is not because it's kind of seems like Ryuk is passive in the whole thing. He's kind of a supervisor. He just wants things to die. He wants people to die. Yeah, and now it's like you've put him directly in the middle of this. Like it, that's what the implication is anyway. But he wants Mia. He even says that he's like I like that girl give her the book and we'll kill some shit if i'm a death god i wouldn't want to fucking work with light anyway i'd want the psychopath that's what i thought we were getting at and then he's like ah fuck it now you're all dead well yeah, yeah. and then this is also the scene where like you know i feel like it was really telegraphed but you find out you know from the horse's mouth you know you find out mia tells light yeah you know I killed those cops. It wasn't Ryuk, you know. I did, you know, I killed... Ooh, she killed somebody else that he didn't want killed. Watari. Oh, yeah, Watari. No, she hid the uh, thing from him so he couldn't burn it. Oh, right, right, right. She withholds the page so it, then he doesn't get saved. She killed the FBI agents and she killed the head of the FBI. Right, that's what it was. That's what's in the calculus book. Right, okay, got you, got you. So after they have this kind of just hissing and scratching kind of debate, like we just said, um, she takes the book and then, like, the Ferris wheel starts to fall apart and then, okay, this fucking soundtrack. We have to talk about this soundtrack. It's a good soundtrack. I liked it. It's a good soundtrack up until and after this moment because, like, when this fucking song kicks in as they're both hanging from this Ferris wheel, I just it, I broke. Oh, I'm I'm talking about the actual like score, not the not the not the songs. The licensed songs are a fucking joke, and this was so out of place. They're all out of fucking place. I don't want to live without your love. And like, Why are we making a John fucking Hughes movie? What's happening here? Why is this here? Again, this whole sequence is beautifully shot. Like, there's a lot of cool sequences that are slow-mo. You get some cool distant shots, them dangling. It looks scary as shit. Wait, get some more rain on these kids. Get some more rain on them. It does rain a lot in this movie. I guess they really wanted people to know it was in Seattle. They're like, hey, you know the stereotype about Seattle that people joke about with the rain? What if we just make, like, every important scene have it rain, you know? You know? In slow-mo. In slow motion, too. Really hit those fucking drops home, huh? Yes, yeah, so then Mia, she fucking falls. Well, they both fall. I was thinking they were both going to die the first time I watched this because I didn't know it was coming. Um, and I like how she, it, just the way this plays out, like she falls and like the tip of her fingers reaches out and grabs like the teeniest, tiniest corner of this page and it just kind of goes... Pops out the book. So fucking stupid. <laughs> and we find out why that happens. 
fucking so dumb. So she falls, dies instantly. Thank God. Good riddance. Please leave the film. Which is kind of cool. She like falls into like this flower stand and like all these petals go flying up. He says she strikes the shoreline. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is the shoreline the beach? She struck the boardwalk that the Ferris wheel is on. I was like, she didn't strike the shoreline. She fucking fell on a some a wooden structure. <laughs> I thought he was going to fall right on top of her. Yeah, the logistics of their fall doesn't really make any sense. I mean, he would have had to like launch himself out like 20 feet. He has to arc out a lot to get into the water to the point where he'd be submerged and like need to be go like need to be retrieved like a running jump out of the cart. Yeah, and like Mia falls straight down and dies. I don't know. They I feel like they just like they they take the concept from the comic where he could basically write out like in it like evolved instructions for people to do before they're killed and and they just they they take that concept and they like make it even broader where now all of a sudden even though he's not dying he can write things that people can do to him so that that basically effective whether he lives or dies whereas like it's like layers of control we weren't exactly told could exist exactly exactly i don't think there was anything ever like that in the original and it just comes out of left field and i mean i guess maybe for the sake of the movie like it coming out of left field is the point but i don't think it really works it's so light hits the water mia dies they retrieve well Someone retrieves light. We're not exactly shown who yet. And the same person kind of picks up the book and walks off with it. Light is... Well, they, they cut to L, who's being grilled at a uh, police station. And they're basically like, all right, we've had like six killings the past two days. So you're still convinced that this kid who's in a coma is Kira. Even though you had circumstantial evidence that would disprove that he was involved anyway before uh, him being, you know opposite side of the world and such uh this is this is the this is the hole that they poke in his case and they're basically like they're like get the hell out of here he's been completely discredited yeah they're even like you have friends in high places so that's why we're not fucking throwing your ass in jail because he, he like stole a cop car he fucking put people in danger he has you know he's he's got potential uh murder charges against him and shit like that he's discredited leaves and he's i, I don't remember how well first of all it took me two tries to even understand what light said in the alley because he's just he's just screeching the whole sentence something about calculus book yeah he's like I didn't know death could be dealt out with a calculus book, which is still a very weird thing to kind of take back and be like, what does that even mean? Especially when it when it's so cryptic. He's about to leave, and then like he's like, wait a minute. He's like, Light didn't take. He calls somebody, and he's like, did Light take calculus? And he's like, did his girlfriend? I guess they say yes, and he's like, don't take off. And then he runs off, and then we cut to our closing montage, which is fucking stupid. I'm gonna say something. I liked the use of power of love in the scene. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I wasn't into it. I had never actually, it more comes from musical appreciation. Uh, I grew up hearing the Celine Dion version. And I heard this, I was like, oh my God, synthesizers. I'm in love. <laughs> you know what? I like it too. Not in this fucking movie. Once the credits were rolling, and it was playing over all the production shots. I was like, oh, this is, this is nice. I like this. <laughs> yeah, that I didn't mind as much. That was kind of cool. So L, uh, blah, 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 blah. lights in a coma. Too many fucking L's. Lights in a coma, and uh, the guy who retrieves the death note from the shoreline comes into his room while he's uh, asleep and puts it on his chest. And then Light wakes up and then takes the death note and sticks it under his pillow. And then Light's dad comes to see him. And he's kind of pieced together. And even he says, he's like, I don't know how you did it, but I want to know why. And he doesn't really explain, like, the methodology of, like, the book to his dad or how it works. He just kind of explains how he escaped death. Yeah. I'm sitting there wondering like is this exactly what he's saying to his dad or is this just like the the way that they had it said just so the audience could follow along because he's like just he's just talking about well i had the death note and i did this and it's like dude his dad is probably sitting there like what the fuck is a death note it all goes back to like a throwaway line they had where you choose between the lesser of two evils and like after two rewatches i'm not even sure what they're referencing what is the other evil i mean the i guess the idea being like and i could be i could be wrong here but i guess the one evil is okay we arrest them and they're in jail and the other evil is oh we just kill them and you know we're just as bad as them i guess is the argument but well it's perspective at this point with how this movie goes because oh let, let the system do what the system does and the system always yeah. fails or we can go the permanent solution and just get rid of these people it's the punisher daredevil conversation from season two you hit them you hit them they go to the they you know they get back up i hit them they stay in the ground so then he explains this story about how and it goes back to like at the dance and he's doing this long voiceover where he's like ex he explains that he quickly he had to have done this very quickly because like <sighs> it's shown in the blink of an Fuck eye this shit okay in the initial sequence and here it's like he spends like he's in a hurry and he's like taking time to think and like look up names and shit and he comes up with this like crazy multi-step convoluted plan involving strangers and like predicting what mia would do and all this other stuff he finds a pedophile doctor 
And then another pedophile. Well, the, the, the doctor was someone who was, uh, he was molesting females under sedation. Females. Women. Sorry. <laughs> I, work at a, I work in an animal hospital. <laughs> Either way, they're both sex offenders in some capacity. Uh, so they're both, so they're both pieces of shit. Yeah, so the doctor is the one who, he, he manipulates the doctor into retrieving him from the water. He manipulates the mailman pedophile to retrieve the death note and start writing names in it in his stead, basically. Like, he would wake up every morning, write names to the book, and then just go about his day, and then and after the 48 hours, he would kill himself by, you know, suicide. And then the doctor places light into a medically induced coma. For three days. Yeah, for two, yeah, two, three days. And then also kills himself. And my thing is, like, if the information is out there, these two are proven sex offenders. This dude wouldn't be a doctor in any location anywhere in the country. No. Not not anywhere where he would have credibility to take care of light. He would have no connections anywhere. His connections would be dried up. He'd be a pariah. All right, let's just say hypothetically he was on scene to pull light out and revive him. He wouldn't be in the fucking ambulance with him mm -mm. Right. or at the hospital. He wouldn't be in the ambulance slamming drugs into his system. No, the EMS would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, who are you? You're fucking, I don't know, it's not disbarred, but like you've been like you're discredited as a doctor. It has to be assumed that people know about his past because like, why would that shit just be out on the internet where you can look for it? Real quick, an internet search. Well, he's on the police database, to be fair. He is not fucking practicing anymore, okay? Yeah, yeah. And then explains how he kind of outmaneuvers Mia, because I guess he banked in the fact that she would physically take the book from him, and he writes in the book that if she takes the book from him, that she dies, basically. He's banking on the fact of her love for him. So he's like, if she really loves me, she won't take the book from me. Maybe she has feelings for him. Maybe she's manipulating him. But like, she doesn't express that like, it's all about her and light. Like she's very explicit saying, give me my goddamn book. Here's my question. Are they are they trying to imply then at the end there that he knew she was going to do that and he tried to play it cool? No, he just needed a fail safe or else he was going to die. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying though is this, did he act like he that was his fail safe? But the reality is he knew she would do that so that he he set up this whole fucking situation so that he would be out of the, the fucking, you know, spotlight on it either way. Out of the guilt, you mean? Yeah, I mean, I could just be giving this verse of the character way too much credit but that's the problem with this this is a very well laid out plan for someone who is who has been shown in the last 90 minutes to be a complete idiot yeah and not only that he fucking hatches this within three minutes and writes it down and writes it all fucking down in detail i can't write down prescriptions real fast like this dude is writing down fucking like and i gotta talk to doctors who are like blah 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 blah, blah. it would take me five minutes to write out what i had for breakfast there's a reason why i've never gotten a fucking food service industry because i can't be a waiter i can't write that fast and he blasts this whole plan down in the paper and then runs off and it's 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 so convoluted and so just overcomplicated, it, it's unbelievable. But, like, if they wanted to do that, that's fine. But, like, why did you do it in the way that you did? And then, like, we cut back to light, and he's kind of, he's again saying, like, I thought at first it was all about just hurting bad people. And then while this is happening, Light, uh, not Light, God, they really should have changed Light's fucking name for this movie. <laughs> light and L is too similar. Uh, L goes to uh, Mia's apartment and hilariously breaks down her door uh, by seemingly just tossing his entire body into it. No, it's her house. She lives in a house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that right. Her home. That's her home. He kicks her fucking door down and then goes into her room. Where are the parents? It's still comical, because, like, he kicks the door down, like, fucking falls on his ass, and his door, like, blasts into five pieces. Yeah, but it's even, it's even, it's even more bizarre, because it's somebody's fucking home. Like, he starts, like, going through her shit, like, he goes through her clothes drawer, I'm like, this is weird. He's, like, dumping out fucking drawers in the floor, like, you're, one, it's somebody else's house, two, this is a dead girl. <laughs> you're, you're going through her shit! Let's just fucking chalk that up for the cops, too. Uh, yeah, and then he finds his calculus book and finds the page that Mia stole all the names on it and Watari's name no uh yeah, Watari's name on it, and, uh... Yeah, but there's also other people's names on it as well. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of names written on it. And then what I, fe and what I feel like is a big fucking cop-out... It's the FBI agent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ryuk shows up in the hospital room, starts laughing, and L Light looks at him, and Ryuk just says, You humans are so amusing, as L is shown in Mia's room, and it looks like he's about to write down Light's name, and the movie ends. <laughs> And a big old fart. Yep. I think the ending is kind of miserable. It Like, we're presented with lots of really shitty people, and there's really no resolution. It's open-ended, but it's fucking shit. Yeah. And it's also like, L, I mean, first of all, he ran, he, he was acting irrationally before, but like, he made it a point to say, I don't kill, and then he's like, fuck it, I'm gonna kill this dude. <laughs>
Well, he, that's the only way he thinks he can stop him. But he also looks like he hesitates, and then, like, you don't ever get an answer on that. It just, like you said, it just ends. If they make a sequel to this, I'll be real surprised. I don't want it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you even do, then, with a sequel? Because every important character knows who he is. And now L has the power to end Light with that piece of paper from the Death Note, and... Light doesn't know L's real name, so he can't do anything about it. In a different movie, but like, oh, the tables have really fucking turned because now, like, Light for the first time since this whole thing began is finally in the driver's seat. Sort of, but it's a little too fucking late at this point. Yeah, exactly. The problem is, like, it's everything that's good in this movie is too little too late. What what he does at the end of this movie and like how he plots this all out is what he's been should what he should have been doing throughout the entire fucking film. Well, I think that's the problem with you know not the not the problem, but one of the biggest problems. With um, we mentioned at the beginning how there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't work in this and like we mentioned the 80s vibe um i don't think the gore really it, i mean it's it's awesome to look at but it seems kind of misplaced in what could be like a movie about two people having like uh you know a war of intelligence trying to outmaneuver each other and we are once again finding ourselves at, at the the point where we have another anime adaptation that is just like disrespectfully disregarded the source material to the point where like the final product is like this doesn't even this, this has almost zero ties the original fine for somebody to be its own thing so it can exist on its own like my friend loves the resident evil movies because he says like on their own he's like they're fine they're just like stupid action movies he's like they're terrible resident evil movies i'm like okay as long as you're that way as long as you feel that way <laughs> for sure for, and, and i guess that's where i'm coming from as well like why do american filmmakers or production companies feel like they need to make a property from another country into something completely different. Just why? If it's all laid out for you, why don't you just make the fucking thing the same in English? Like, you know who did that really well? Uh, the guy who directed uh, Let the Right One In. That was fucking great. The French movie's fantastic. And guess what? The American version's awesome too. You want to know why? Because they essentially made the same fucking movie just in English. I think the reason why they did it the way they did is because, like, yeah, there's that train of thought, which, you know, works occasionally, but then there's also the school of thought of like hey if we're gonna remake this and like we're gonna put our own spin on it we might as well actually put our own spin on it rather than just you know copy paste which you know in this movie's case doesn't work in its favor it's a complete fucking fumble by wingard who did not handle the fallout from this very well no he didn't know what to do with it he kind of got like flipping and kind of bitter with people when they were like hey this isn't that good and he, I can't remember his exact response but he had a he had a laughable response why how could you be so cocky about yeah, I mean, I, I okay, I understand. Like, that's the nature of making art. Like, you're going to be ridiculed, especially when you take something beloved and kind of redo it. That's prime to be fucking ripped apart for. But he's doing what he does to the best of its ability, and it's awesome for what he does. Again, this is not the movie for him to stretch those legs with. It's kind of like Josh Trank's Fantastic Four. Exactly. The idea of, like, a fucking Cronenbergian superhero movie is fascinating. However, you took this, like, bright, uppity 1960s, like, nuclear family who hasn't changed in goddamn 50 years, and you turned them into these fucking horror shows. Do something else. Why did you take the Fantastic Four and turn them into that? Like, I don't want to see them that way. Yeah, Fox was like, this is a good idea. And then within months they're like this is a bad idea and granted the fallout from that movie was way worse than what's happening here because this is just a fucking netflix movie that people have seemingly forgotten about already yeah but i don't know why people are so mad about that fantastic four movie you have two other ones that are shit as well but better than this newer one <laughs> they, and and they haven't ruined anything because the fantastic four haven't been relevant in 20 years to the point where marvel doesn't even fucking have their own comic line anymore dude but yeah but like i would love to see them done like proper like not maybe maybe not have their own movie but like just appear that would be cool he slapped a vibe onto this that just doesn't belong exactly he he pasted an aesthetic that like works in the guest and your next because your next like lives and breathes fucking retro slashers and it's he tried carrying like what he knows to this and it's just it's ugh. <laughs> you essentially have like a noir crime drama with horror elements and, and again you're trying to like just copy and paste the 80s thing over that and it, it doesn't jive not at all so so what are our final thoughts on this guys <laughs> see here's my thing with this movie for me personally, like, what do you think of it? I'm like, it's terrible. Go watch it right now. Because <laughs> it is, I find it to be not on the level of the room, but a movie so just wretchedly made that it gets me laughing. And I find it very amusing. And I would probably watch it if it was on, only because I love to laugh at it. It's a weird movie to recommend to people. It's definitely going in the trash. 
It's like if I picked the inside of a piece of bread out and ate all the bread on the inside and threw out the crust. That's how I feel about this movie. <laughs> Some people like me love to eat the crust. So <laughs> I would never tell anybody to watch this. If you watched it on mute, it would be a decent movie. Um, if you didn't have to listen to the fucking dialogue or the exposition, the little of which is there, I think it's fine. It's shot really well. The gore is done really well. The music, the, the music score, not necessarily the 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 licensed songs, but that's done well. Ryuk is great. Every scene with Ryuk is worth watching. They nailed it with uh with Defoe. He did a fantastic job, but it just comes up short. Sean put it the best. They tried to cram too much into this movie. Like this is the, it's the same problem with the fucking Dark Tower movie. Like you're trying to squish all this shit in and then end the movie. The track record now of like anime adaptations is just so bad. I can't believe we're still doing this. Just why bother? Like. Why bother? Like, the Dragon Ball movie should have been the lesson everybody took home and just kept it in their heads forever. Uh-oh, I think we should do that one. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Just got shut the fuck down. I'd rather die. Uh <laughs> oh, that's gonna be... I don't know, that'd be a good one. I didn't see Ghost in the Shell. I just... I'm like, I'm good. I haven't seen that yet, but I really like the... I Now, that I've seen a bunch of times, and I actually want to see the live action. It looks like it... It, it can fare pretty well. That's the thing. Like, if you're gonna do the anime movie, like you have to go all out and make it stylized. You have to. Im you have to embrace the material, the silliness, and the cultural relevance of the source material. Because, like, Dragon Ball on paper is stupid as fuck. You can't make changes to that, or you're gonna make it stupid to the point where it's not relatable. Like, Dragon Ball is about fucking martial arts aliens who just consistently try to fucking read each other's power levels and everybody's named after fruit and vegetables. It's super silly shit. It's the dumbest fucking thing ever. And it's written so poorly and I love it to death. Japan does their live action things pretty well. Because they're faithful and people go, oh, that's so fucking silly. But it's like, yeah, but it's like the anime or it's like the manga. Like Yes, they they understand that like that filmmaking aesthetic way better than we do because it's in their culture. And like, I don't know if you've ever seen the Roroni Kenshin live action movies, but they're fucking batshit. They're awesome. No, I haven't seen it. But have you seen the original Dragon Ball movie that was Japanese? No, I haven't. Yeah, that shit's fucking crazy. And it's awesome. I rented Kashurn a long time ago from like a blockbuster. And that's an anime adaptation. And like, it's like, it's kind of a weird, low budget sci-fi thing film but it's super fun even like shin godzilla you know some people are like oh that's fucking stupid it's a guy in a suit and i'm like this is perfect like they nailed it yes this is what a godzilla movie should be and they made godzilla scary again yeah he's fucking creepy as shit uh it's the guy who did evangelion and um what was the other thing they did uh attack on titan and they turned godzilla into like this creepy amorphous atomic monster which he should be you know he's the embodiment of the fallout of hiroshima well they re they redid it obviously to update it a little bit i'm i'm glad you mentioned attack on titan because i watched both those live action movies and like i haven't seen that yet and i really wanted to see that aside from being super silly looking because it's like you know they, they don't have a hollywood budget but it's fine they nail without question the amount of horrifying violence that's in the anime yeah well it's all practical too i, I watched the behind the scenes for it i really want to see it it is fucking ghastly it like people People are literally just scooped up and just like munched on up close. And like you, there's scenes where someone's sitting inside someone's stomach. As it should be. It's gross and it's wonderful. Uh, but it, but it has it, the problem is it it looks like Power Rangers, so you kind of get this little like it it's like you're like. <laughs> <laughs> Therein lies the problem when it comes over here because they're like, oh, that's so fucking stupid and cheesy, and it's like, yeah, but that's kind of sort of the point almost to an extent. It depends on your taste. I, I don't know. I I can't really explain it too well. Uh, but it's definitely a cultural cultural thing, and either you get it or you fucking don't. If this Akira movie ever gets made, which I don't think it will, because at this point we're we're past a decade of. Of like we're making it we're not i'm still waiting for james cameron's battle angel alita like when the fuck's that ever happening he's got to make his avatar films first here are my two favorite anime adaptations made by north america guyver and guyver 2 that's the end of the list but that was done by screaming mad george <laughs> that's why <laughs> You have a Japanese guy making a fucking Japanese adaption of something that he loves, and he did all the fucking special effects, and David Gale. If you're listening to this, you've never seen The Giver. Please watch it, if anything, to watch Mark Hamill turn into a giant cockroach. The, it's so fucking good. The Giver's awesome. Kind of like, you look at it and go, oh, monsters, this is like an industrial movie, and like a guy in a suit. Oh my god, he cut that person's head off. Oh my god, intestines. Oh my god. <laughs>
fucked. Have you seen the anime of that? It's fucking bonkers. I love that one too. I haven't, and I really want to. But back to this, you're like, yeah, I like. I would recommend to people who first, first of all, certainly not to people who love the anime. It's the point where they would get mad about it. But I would probably recommend it to people who love shit movies. I had a good time with it, but I also can acknowledge the fact that it is just through and through a bad movie. I don't think anybody needs to watch this. <laughs> oh, we did say in the beginning, it's for nobody. It is made for nobody. Right in the garbage for me. It's made for nobody because it has things that I really hold dear to my heart. And it's taking from a culture that I really enjoy and, and uh, the media that comes from that culture. And the mashup is just shit. And that's my opinion. I, I guess I would be, you know, Connor said he's somewhere in the middle. I mean, I would put it there if it wasn't Death Note, but as like a fan of the original material, like, I mean, I could see people that like the original, like being into this film. Like, I, I don't think that's too far flung of an idea, but I'm not like, you know, it would be in the middle. And then like, I would just continue to push it down until like my arm just like was completely covered in muck. <laughs> You know, as far down as I could physically push it dumpster down. Dumpster juice. Yeah, you know. Basically, in terms, everybody can understand, like, shoulder deep into a dumpster. Yeah, yeah. Like, maybe not quite at the bottom, but, like, as far as that arm's going in there. And the average person the average person will not reach that far into a trash can to get something, so. If I saw a $20 bill in the dumpster, and I reached my arm down there and got covered in all of this shit, and then pulled it out and realized it was a piece of Monopoly money, that's how I feel about this movie. Exactly. That, that's, that's pretty much where I'm coming from with this. I'm trying, like, I know I can compared it to the original stuff a bunch of times but like you know it, it just kills me because like the way that the characters interact in the original content is like so much better than here like you know in the original you know light's like way more calculated like he has a couple scenes in the movie that he is calculating but it's you know it's just you know when it suits the you know the the plot whereas in the original it was just like from day one he was kind of like all right i'm fucking smart i could do this blah 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 and then he has like one scheme after another you know oh l thinks that you know he's he's kira they're gonna put security cameras in his house okay well how is he gonna continue to kill people so that they still don't think it's him well what if he has a fucking mini tv and a bag of potato chips and like it's in the one blind spot of like the 40 cameras in the room and he just happens to look down at it occasionally and write on a scrap of death note with a tiny pen like the fucking names of people this is the scene that everybody fucking talked about before this movie came out they're like it's it's like when people kept asking like hey is the teen orgy scene an it no stop asking except in this case the scene in question is hilarious and i wished it was in there <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ but yeah i guys I would have said the scene where Richie and Bill are in Georgie's room looking at the book and they see Pennywise and they see themselves in in the uh, in the photo. I would say that that could have been in there but wasn't. But the orgy, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. How about the turtle? For the last time, we don't need to see it. We never need to see it. Stop asking about it. There's just other stuff like that I get from like a a filmmaking per perspective why they didn't delve into like Mia in the original her, her name's Misa in the original but uh she has like her own death god and her own death note and there's like a whole lot of other characters like there's an entire police squad and and Light's dad that basically end up teaming up together to try to take Kira out which is like totally like absent from this film like in this film everyone like thinks Kira is never going to be put away and, and like Light's dad's the only one that gives a shit it's just like it's so drastically different that it's just like you know, I can't like stop saying like, why did you use this source? Like, I get why they use the source material. Here's the thing: I I kind of know how the manga and the anime ends, and to a degree, when you compare them, at least in the anime, even if anime isn't for you and you're interested in this concept, you get fucking resolution. Okay. Without saying what happens, yeah, totally. Yeah, there is there is an end to the story. At least you know light story. Um, is, I could be a little wrong, but like at the end of the series, I'm pretty sure I've heard it mentioned that like throughout the shenanigans of the history with light and the death note, like they've essentially knocked crime and like kind of evil shit on the planet down a sizable percentage. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like the whole point is, is, you know, like I always fell on, like I had a friend who, who loved light as a character from beginning to end. Like, you know, that was his favorite character. And mine was L and you know, some shit happens throughout the series for people that have read it or seen it. So you kind of know where it goes, but it, you know, I don't want to say what happens because it's kind of one of those series that like, 
it, it like to know what happens kind of like ruins it to a certain extent. Yeah. So like in in the manga, and I guess you know in the in the original stuff in general, there is a point where that stuff totally comes up, just like in the movie. Like yeah, he killed four hundred people. We're not gonna. We're just not gonna not kill him. But it's it's a lot more clear cut. Like in the movie, you know, it's some light spoilers from the manga because it's early on. But like in the movie, like light is pissed when you know what he thinks is Ryuk, but it's really Mia kills all these FBI agents. But in the original con, you know, the original series, he fucking straight up does that as like a power play they should have never had the mia element to begin with right yeah they should have made it more straightforward more calculated more like the source material and then if it did well make a sequel like what's the problem what i think happened here and i I could be misreading this but i think they were just afraid to have a main character that was just an asshole because like people people like light as a character he's almost like a heisenberg type character like you like him because he's an interesting character and the things he does to get in and out of situations and to like play mind games with his opponent are fucking cool like it, it the drama's really good it's because the moral the conversation that we have about morals and ethics afterwards is intriguing you want to watch uh walter white become more monstrous because the journey from him being a cancer-ridden chemistry teacher to actual drug kingpin who is willing to kill the drop of a hat is a fascinating journey and what pisses me off about this movie is that they took a concept and like right before like i was talking to people at work about this when the trailer came out and they had no idea what this was i was like they're like what is it? i'm like it's a movie where it's about a book that you can get and you write someone's name in it and I explain the concept and then we had like an hour-long conversation about what kind of power that would mean to a regular person and yeah. this it the, like the 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 philosophy behind the existence of the book is just like completely dismissed in favor of like fucking em- emphasis on Mia and silly shit and like there's no time spent on like the weight of this device like it is the- you are wielding godhood in your hand and we get this <laughs> just to finish my like i guess what i was trying to say then just going off your point connor is that i guess like by the end of the series there totally is that question because it's it, it takes place over a much longer period of time i mean in this movie it's like what a week you know in the book it's like literally years of like him basically being kira so you know there is that line in the sand where it's like okay yeah he's killing people and they're bad people but eventually like where's the line in the sand like where does it stop being just you know rapists and murderers and now it's like people that like evaded their taxes or people that are you know smell selling dope on the streets and then there's also the 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 batman train of mind which is kind of what light and the police force have in the comic of like hey like yeah like you're killing these people and they're bad but like you shouldn't have you know you shouldn't decide who lives and dies and that's kind of like l's point in the movie too but it's just so brushed over that it doesn't really hold a lot of impact because he's the only character fucking saying it in the whole movie yeah and it's like it's the it's the punisher conundrum where you have people around him who are like i can't condone what he does but i'm still not gonna complain about it because he's making like as an officer like some people would think like he's making my life a lot safer and a lot easier because i don't have to worry about going out in the street tomorrow and getting shot by some gangbanger. But even that's not explained really well because they did that in Luke, like with Luke Cage, where there's a whole scene where like, yeah, you're doing good stuff for the people, and there's a lot more of that than there is about him being uh, a bad guy in the eyes of the police force. And with the Punisher, it's like he is he is kill he he is killing bad people, but he is still like the most prolific killer of all time in the Marvel universe. Uh, and like he he's it's not morally okay, but there's a conversation to be had about whether what he's doing is helping or not. And that's where I think the 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 movie totally missteps, where they just they completely squander the idea of having like a philosophical struggle about having this book and what to do with it at the end there with his father he's like basically saying you know oh you know i figured it out because i found the news clipping of the guy that killed your mother in your room and he's like he basically no matter what light says whether he admits to how he did it or not like the moral conversation isn't hey like i agree with what you did but it's bad or hey like oh we were not going to do anything it's just like dude he knows and when you get out of this hospital you're going to jail like that that's it like there's no like further fucking story to be told it would be an interesting move if they actually elaborate on that and actually had his dad protect him and he would go against his own like in his own moral code of being a police officer because now because now his own blood is implicated in the deaths of hundreds of thousands and like his job says put him in jail but his heart would say no protect him he's my son right it's either that or the sequel opens and light immediately writes his dad's name in the fucking notebook it's you know one of the other oh jesus christ (laughs) no We don't even get to explore that part of it. Like, the last... Okay, if you were gonna... Like, what Connor just said, like, that whole piece of storyline could have been fantastic if that was, like, the last 20 or 30 minutes of this movie where he finds out that Light is Kira 
and the father has to kind of wrestle with that a little bit. There's just so many missed opportunities with this movie that they just glossed over and were just like, okay, we're gonna make uh, again, we're gonna we're gonna make this fucking stupid throwback movie that doesn't make any sense. It's it's almost like when presented with two choices, like Adam Wingard just like consistently made the poorer choice. Like there's like clear cut better alternatives to most of what's happening. And it's just it like it's it's almost like I know that you're capable. And this is what ups- this is what's upsetting me. <laughs> Adam did what he knows. And I don't fault him for that, but I agree with you where he should have challenged himself a little bit more and said, okay, fine. Like I'm, I'm so used to doing this and, but that's kind of who he is. That's what he does for, and all of his projects have that aesthetic. And I don't even know if he knows how to do anything else. That's fine. I appreciate the fact that Vin Diesel can only be three characters. I accept him. Riddick and the Fast and the Furious guy. Yeah, don't forget the wheel, man. And that triplex guy. But that's the, that's, that's bottom of the barrel. Quite frankly, I prioritize Riddick over the other two. Where's my fucking Riddick sequel? You're never gonna get it. No, I'm gonna get one after he cashes out Fast 15. We're gonna we're we're gonna get an old man Riddick movie now. Yes. <laughs> I love how I love how they did that Riddick movie. People are like this sucks, and they're like, okay, uh, we're gonna make Riddick, but like Pitch Black 2. All right, how's that? Good. Everyone's like, we want this. Nobody wants to see it. Yeah, right. I was like, oh, that looks cool. Never spent the money on it. So that's it. That's Death Note from 2017, directed by Adam Wingard. If you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Follow us at Movie Dumpster on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also check out our sister podcast, The Phantom Zone, hosted by our very own Connor McGraw. You can find them at phantomzonepodcast.wordpress.com. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. And I'm Connor McGraw. And thanks for visiting the dumpster. Wait, wait, wait! Didn't I clearly explain what would happen if Watsity wasn't safely returned to me? Wait, you need to understand how it works. Okay, or you can't stop it. I couldn't stop it. Death give me handed it through a fucking calculus book. Stall it! No, I'm not. I swear to God, I'm not, okay? I'm just going to turn around really slowly. Okay. I'm going to reach into my bag. Don't move. Do not move. This man is Keita. I'm working with law enforcement in order to capture and eliminate... <laughs> Oh, Kara.